Welcome everyone to the 12th installment of California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines with our host, Elaine Chacon Brown. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. This month, our host, Elaine, leads conversations with some outstanding producers dedicated to illustrating California terroir through the lens of classic grape varieties, Zinfandel, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet Sauvignon. While the conversations offer a deeper understanding of these varieties and the role they play in the history of California wine, more importantly, we hope they reveal the new directions grape growers and winemakers are headed in the way they cultivate and work with them in the cellar. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming Nicole Hitchcock of J Vineyards and Winery. So before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants that we encourage you to use. There is a chat section as well as a Q&A section. So these are different. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. And then there's the Q&A section, and this is where we'd like you to submit your questions for Elaine and Nicole to answer toward the end of the webinar. Uh, we will do our best to address all questions, but please know that any that are not answered live will be provided in the Q&A summary in the email you'll receive following the program. In this email, we'll also provide a list of export markets for the wines presented. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine. In addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American specialist for JancisRobinson.com and contributes to a long list of respected publications. She contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently, as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. She was named by the International Wine and Spirits Competition and Vid Italy as one of the top five wine communicators of the year in the world these last two years in a row. And Nicole, a native Californian, Nicole has a degree in viticulture and enology from the University of California at Davis and an MBA from the Wine Business Institute at Sonoma State University. She's worked in Umbria, Italy, Western Australia and renowned California wineries, including Robert Mondavi Winery and Ian J. Gallo Winery. Today, she is winemaker at J Vineyards and Winery, concentrating on crafting sparkling and still wines in the Russian River Valley, Valley and the North Coast of California. Now, Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Elaine, how are you? I'm good, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for making time. Yeah, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. Good. I, um, I'm really excited to speak with you today because we have a unique opportunity to talk about what it takes to make sparkling versus what it takes to make still. I think um, a lot of people don't really understand the deeper intricacies of that. And a lot of it goes back to the vineyard. Could you tell us just a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I can speak to, um, to, you know, the vineyards that we source from at Jay. We, we have, um, six estate vineyards across uh, Sonoma County. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit more to those specific uh, properties a little bit later. Um, so we source from, um, from our estate vineyards. We also source from some growers that we've worked with for years and years. Um, so it varies in terms of um, where we're bringing in our sparkling fruit and our still fruit. Um, obviously there's some, you know, some differences in our approach to, to farming. Um, both types of, uh, of wines. Um, for sparkling, we're, uh, we're bringing in only kind of the core, um, you know, traditional sparkling varieties, so Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, uh, and Pinot Meunier. Um, and the Russian River Valley is, is such an ideal place to, to grow these varieties, both for still as well as for sparkling. Um, but, you know, being kind of in that colder uh, pocket of Sonoma County, um, it's, you know, it's a match made in heaven for sparkling wines. Um, you know, the climate, um, the topography, the soils, um, you know, they really allow us to produce um, some world-class world -class sparkling wines. Yeah, which is great. I mean, I, I think of Jay as really one of the, um, icon it's become, I think, one of California's iconic sparkling houses. You know, it wasn't the first, but I, I just think the value and quality combination that Jay delivers for sparkling really sets it ahead um, in, in a way that, you know, I know a lot of people, I was speaking with Julia Coney, for example, just a couple days ago, and 
she she calls Jay Cuvée Twenty her her house wine. You know, it's it's a good <laughs> wine that you can actually. It's well worth drinking, and you can afford to drink it every day if you want to. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're fortunate at Jay. We've got quite a legacy of producing uh, sparkling wines. It was, Jay was actually founded as, as a dedicated uh, sparkling wine producer um, back in 1986. Um, so, you know, we've been in biz business for well over 30 years. Um, you're right. We weren't the first, but there, I think, you know, the eighties was really a time when, um, when I think, Producers started to recognize um, the the Russian River Valley and what some of the you know some of the lead uh, varietals and different types of wine could be from the region. Yeah. Um, and so you see this whole you know um, you know influx of um, producers starting to make uh, varietals like Pinot Noir as well as sparkling um, from right around that time. Yeah. So let's go ahead and look at a map because um, to help place us just because I think. The thing about sparkling wine is you do want a cooler growing area, as you mentioned, because that helps you retain acidity. But the truth is, you know, kind of internationally, people are still working to understand that California has those growing conditions. And so we're going to look at how that shows up in Russian River. Um, this first map, just to place everyone, um, you can see there, uh, Jay Vineyards is pointed out and Katie was going to circle it. So we're really going to focus in on Sonoma County specifically. Um, Sonoma County has, uh, you know, quite a bit of coastal influence, actually, even with the mountains there on the coast. Actually, there's a huge opening in the in the mountains that we call the Petaluma Gap, and that ushers in a lot of maritime influence. So if we could do the next map zooming in. Do you want to, Nicole, just talk us through what do we see here? Sure. So, um, you know, the, the outer yellow border is really uh, the border of Sonoma County um, in general. And then as you dive in um, to the center of the map, you'll see the, Rus the border of the Russian River Valley AVA. Um, and so what you can see here is it's kind of smack in the middle of Sonoma County. Um, but if you were to see some of the other uh, AVAs within the county um, transposed onto this map, you would see that the Russian River Valley is really um, one of the most westernmost uh, AVAs. We also have the Sonoma Coast AVA, which borders the Pacific. Um, and there are, you know, definitely some parallels to the Russian River Valley there. Um, but really, the Russian River Valley is kind of the, the core growing region um, that we're looking at here. Well, and really, and you see, um, you, you see a few of our of the Jay Vineyard properties as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about these as we get into the wines. Um, but there's a huge amount of diversity uh, within, within the ABA. Yeah. It's actually yeah. quite a, a large area. Yeah, I mean, historically, Russian River Valley really is the ABA that brings a claim to Sonoma County, you know, um, and there were a lot of other parts of the county that had already been planted, but Russian River really helped um, bring, you know, national and international attention and, and is one of the ABAs of California that I think is a recognized name. If we could actually go back to that map, Katie, I want to um, talk us through a couple other features. I really love that Katie's been making these maps for us using Google Earth. And the thing I love about them is that you can actually see the topography and learn to read um, some details of, of the region. And so what I want to point out here is that the dark green areas are actually all we're literally seeing the forests that are in the mountains in Sonoma County. So you can see there's actually quite a lot of texture through the entire county. The um, Katie right now is highlighting the coastal mountains. And notice that towards the bottom of um, Sonoma County, the green area ends. And um, that is actually what you can see there is a low spot in the mount in the coastal mountain range which is a big opening to the ocean. And you can see it's quite wide and it goes um, south of Sonoma County as well. And that's what an area we call the Petaluma Gap. So it's actually a low spot in the mountains. It, it, the mountain range fully breaks and opens. And the reason I'm highlighting that is because that strongly influences the weather system through all of Sonoma County and really also into Napa Valley and ushers in quite cold maritime air. Do you want to talk to us? How do you see that? in Russian River. 
Yeah, I mean the the fog and the the cool air that comes up from um, from the bay and from some of those low lying southern areas um, is really um, you know the identity of, of Russian River um, when it comes to viticulture. Um, you know what you see is overnight. Um, the fog rolling in up from the south uh, in more of the, the valleys and low-lying areas along the Russian River Valley itself. Um, and so it gets ushered in, and it, it tends to, to cover the whole region overnight. It cools things way down. Um, and then the next morning, uh, it slowly starts to burn off. And it's, I mean, it's fascinating to see. I, I live in Santa Rosa myself, um, and Jay is located up in the town of Healdsburg. So it's about a 15, 20 minute drive up the, up the highway. And you can literally see just the fingers of the fog retracting back. Um, and they follow the Russian river all the way, uh, down to, um, down to the ocean. So, um, it is definitely a defining, uh, factor for the region, um, and leads to amazing shifts in temperature. Yeah. Um, you know, during, during, um, harvest and during the growing season, a lot of times I'm out of the vineyards, um, at, at sunrise and it's freezing. It can be like, you know, in the forties, I've got a warm jacket on. Um, and then within the next few hours, um, I'm pulling that jacket off because you can have temperature shifts of, you know, 40 degrees plus on any given day. Yeah. Which is amazing. And the, the other thing too, is the fog actually changes the influence of the sunlight itself so that, um, you know, the areas that have long fog lasting later into the morning, the sun literally is not penetrating, um, into the vine area. And so it's actually like a diffusing filter for sunlight exposure too. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great point. Um, one of the, let's go ahead and start talking about wine and we can keep talking about Russian river, but, but you know, these features that we're talking about, the big diurnal shift, um, the, the dif diffusing of light impact on the fruit zone, these are all really important for, for sparkling wine because we want to retain the acidity for the sparkling, but also that kind of purity of flavor. Sometimes direct sun exposure can, can kind of, I think of it as creating burnished flavors. They become a little darker and, um, and more like they have a patina to them. But we, with the sparkling, we really want that flavor purity. And so let's go ahead and start talking about the sparkling wine and then we can um, look at Russian River some more as we keep going too. It's- um, Absolutely. Again, the um again this cuvee 20 it's i just think of it as you know if somebody calls me up and people do you know from other countries or from other parts of this of the country and they'll be like i really need a california wine um you know what's a good solid wine i can bring to a get together that i want to bring a california wine you know the the truth is the two flagships from jay are things that are easy go-to recommendations because they're both really affordable but they're also available. And I think that combination can be, can be hard to find sometimes, you know, both available and affordable can be tricky. And especially for sparkling, um, you know, the, the suggested retail here is 38, but I, but I readily find it for less than that as well. And it just makes it um, an easy go-to, you know, do you want to talk though about, you know, this is a wine that's made from multiple vineyards. And then of course the, the different varieties. Could you talk to us just about how do you how do you approach blending with a sparkling wine? That's something that's completely different than how you would approach blending for a red or a white. So could you talk us through that? Sure, absolutely. So um, so the grapes from this are are sourced from Russian River Valley. It's um, Appalachian Russian River, um, and like I mentioned before, it's a um, it's Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier. It's a little bit Chardonnay dominant. Um, Fifty four percent Chard, forty three percent Pinot Noir, and then the balance is Meunier. Um, and so for this, I mean, you talked about purity a moment ago, um, Elaine. And so I think, um, and, and, and talked about how kind of the dilution of sunlight, et cetera, um, contributes to that. Um, absolutely. In the vineyard, we're looking for just really pristine farming, clean grapes, um, because, and, and a little bit of shading as well. So that's one difference in terms of, um, in terms of farming still versus sparkling um, grapes. We don't want a lot of sunlight. We just want a nice little dappling to allow the fruit to ripen, but allow the, um, the, the pure flavors to carry through. Um, and so all of this is handpicked. Um, we bring it into the winery when it's, when it's cold at night. 
Um, it goes into our Cacard, one of our Cacard presses, uh, which is actually pretty unique to us. Um, there's not a lot of Cacard presses right. uh, in California. Um, it's a traditional champagne press mm -hmm. that, um, that we imported. Um, well, and I think you were, the so first, we take a couple you were the first to bring it in I, into California, too, from what I understand. We were indeed, yeah. Um, in the early days of Jay, we, we brought in one Cacard press, uh, and we liked it so much that, um, that we purchased another one. So, so we've got two on the property currently. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we take a, we take a press cut. Um, we separate um, both fractions of juice into a cuvee and a tie. Um, and that's really the first step when we're talking about um, developing just a broad palette with which we can uh, later blend. Um, and so the cuvee, like free run, um, has a huge, really nice purity of fruit and brightness. The high brings with it some mouthfeel as well as some, um, you know, more color um, and just more phenolics in general. Um, and so when it comes time for blending, usually this falls in, you know, call it um, January, February of the following year. Um, you know, we've got something like 60 plus um, different unique lots to, um, to blend with, um, some of which are fermented in stainless steel, some of which are fermented in neutral barrel. Right. Um, we conduct selective malolactic. So we've got a lot of different, um, different options to, to blend with to really create um, the style and reflection of, of what we're trying to do. So, so for I this, for the QV20... Yeah, no, for, for the QV20, um, we've, we've started to lean more in recent years to um, more of a neutral barrel fermentation along with, a, you know, a few stainless steel ferments, um, but a touch more malolactic. Um, and, you know, this is, we've shifted style a little bit from, um, from where we've been traditionally with this. The very first vintage of this was 2006. Um, and so the idea here was to give it, you know, creaminess, um, just a, a broad palette, um, notes of marzipan, nice toast yeastiness. Um, this wine spends a minimum of 30 months on tourage. Um, sometimes it's longer than that, um, which again is, is kind of unique. There's, um, you know, we, we think that time on tourage contributes a lot to, to our sparkling wines. And so um, we're willing to make that commitment. The thing about this wine that I appreciate so much is it's um, there is the that complex of flavors you describe and and it really kind of um, it grabs the mouth just a little bit you know so that the flavors can really be present in the mouth but it and it does you know it has some breadth there so there's an element of richness but there's absolutely no heaviness you know um, sometimes richer sparkling wines can become laborious and it totally avoids that the, the raciness and spine of this wine are so strong that they, they can the two things complement each other really well. One of the questions that's coming up is um, just how do you balance that, that phenolic presence? Cause I know with sparkling wine, you have to be really careful about the phenolics because it, in moving through the secondary fermentation, too much can create a real sense of bitterness. And so how are you managing that kind of thing in, in working with the fruit and moving through the two stages of fermentation? Sure, yeah. Um, I think it, it, it's all of that gentle upfront, um, upfront work that, um, that allows us to manage our, our phenolic load properly. Um, it's the, you know, having nice intact fruit, picking at night, keeping it cold. And then, and then the Picard press, um, is, is really key. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not pressing terribly hard. We're not trying to extract every last drop out of it. What we're trying to do is, um, is extract the right type of, the right type of juice with the right mouthfeel, um, that, you know, in the end is going to give us, um, give us a nice balance in the, in the overall wine. Um, you know, in, in terms of blending, um, my approach for blending is to taste everything blind. Uh -huh. um, so I don't know <laughs> what is what. Um, sometimes there's a good indication if it's bright pink, I know that it's probably a Pinot Noir uh, tie lot. Um, but, but in general, I don't know what is what. Um, and so um, me and my team will go through and we'll, we'll rank each of the wines, we'll give them a grade, we'll write down tasting notes um, prior to doing any blending so that we're not biased um, by any means. We're just, we're looking 
solely um, at the qualities of, of each individual lot so that when we can blend, we can manage things like phenolics, we can manage right. things like, um, like color and acidity, et cetera. One of the other questions that's coming in too is just um, in terms of looking at fruit quality, besides the simple alcohol numbers and acid numbers, what, what quality of fruit do you look to to differentiate what goes into sparkling versus what goes into still? Sure. Um, we're looking for, um, like I mentioned before, fruit that is farmed in a very clean manner. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't want to see any faults with the, with the fruit. Um, you know, it needs to be clean, intact, um, you know, no rot, no, none of those things that, um, you know, you want to avoid because with sparkling wine, and I think you alluded to it earlier, um, uh, any type of fault that you see early on is only going to be exacerbated right. later in the bottle. Um, so whether or not that's a mouthfeel issue, whether or not it's, um, you know, some other, some other type of defect, um, you have to be really careful to just have nice, clean, pure fruit that, that goes into this. Um, in terms of uh, spraying what might be a still wine, um, you know, vineyard from a sparkling vineyard, um, I tend to try to go with, uh, with clones that have uh, larger berries. Um, meaning they have a larger, you know, juice to juice to skin ratio, um, so that we get less of the, the phenolic extraction, um, during pressing, um, and beyond that, just, you know, nice, clean farming. Right. No, that's great. So another question coming up for sparkling, and then we'll start looking at the reds as well, is, um, just how do you handle the, um, kind of yeast introduction for the secondary fermentation? Sure, we do a um, we do a build up, um, and so uh, as we're as we're coming up on the week where, when we're going to be tirage bottling, um, we do we just do it. It's a week long culture build up. Um, it's a process that we kind of um, uh, imported also from Champagne. Um, so it's a very classic classic process. But essentially, um, you know, it's uh, it's base wine, it's cane sugar, it's yeast. Um, and then we, we do the buildup over several days, monitoring um, the health of the yeast um, counts, et cetera. And so this would be with the, when the, the wine that's gone through one fermentation, it's still all together. And then you, you do a buildup process to introduce more yeast and then go into individual bottles for the secondary fermentation. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So we have, we have our base wine and it's the blend that we've put together with all of the different components. Um, it's filtered, um, clean and ready to go. Um, and then the, and then the yeast culture buildup, we, um, yeah, it's the, it's the yeast and the sugar, et cetera. And then on the day of tirage, we add that, uh, that buildup to that base wine, uh, and then it goes into each individual bottle. Right. Um, goes into bins and then goes into a nice, uh, nice cool place where it's going to finish that secondary fermentation in the bottle and then rest for, um, for another couple of years. Yeah. Which is amazing. It's such a, it's really such an enormous time investment to make sparkling wine. And the, the true, you know, I keep coming back to um, how incredible it is that Cuvée 20 is priced as it is partly because when you start to add up the number of years you've just named, the amount of time that the wine has to be stored without anything being sold like that all adds up to that's a huge cost and a huge investment on the winery side. And so um, that's part of why sparkling wine tends to cost more, but also why it's really remarkable to find a quality one that's more affordable too. you know, hitting that balance is, is difficult. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, in terms of talking about time, um, I've learned as a sparkling winemaker to take exceptionally good notes uh -huh. <laughs> all along the process. Because if you think about it, um, you know, for any given vintage, you're not going to, we're not going to be releasing that sparkling wine for at least three years later. If, and in some cases it's more like eight or nine years right. um, in terms of our late disgorge. And so in order to, you know, continuously, um, improve and evolve, I need to remember what was, what was I thinking as, as I, as we put these, um, these initial base blends together, was I concerned about anything? Was I excited about anything? What, you know, what type of attributes did those base wines have? Um, so that, 
in, you know, two or three years time when I come back and I revisit the wines and we're going to be doing dosage trials and looking at actually releasing them, um, I can connect the dots yeah. and, um, and allow me to make more informed decisions uh, in the future. That's the thing about this type of winemaking that just always boggles my mind and really I admire so much because it's, it's such an example of a long-term commitment, you know, so that you're having to connect the dots from, you know, years ago, you know, you started this process years ago in a way you took a risk to create the blend that gets it started and you don't get to retaste and find out how well it worked until a couple years later. And in the meantime, you've still had more vintages ongoing that you have to make new choices with. It's, um, it's, it, it's just, I, I don't even know what else to say about it, except it's mind boggling, you know, um, and especially the kind of tasting memory that has to be held across all that time as well. But let's go ahead and start looking at the reds, because again, um, Russian River Valley, of course, by now is famous for Pinot. And so we really want to make a point of talking about that. And one of the things that's come out with uh, Russian River um, in the last several years is the idea that it is a substantial AVA, as you mentioned but there are unique neighborhoods of, um, of fruit character and growing conditions. And I know we wanna talk about that some today. So let's go ahead and um, get started looking at the Russian River Pinot, but also pull the map back up so we can look at the different neighborhoods. Um, so, and actually if we could go back one, one map prior to this really quickly. Uh, one of the questions that's come up is um, the language that we use uh, in relation to the topography here. So the low spot in the mountains is called the Petaluma Gap. When we're talking about it in relation to the AVAs, like the Petaluma Gap AVA, we will refer to the Petaluma Wind Gap because part of the thing, uh, the, one of the import, really important things with, with this low spot in the mountains is it is an opening to the ocean and it effectively pulls in maritime fog and also very cold daily winds that come in from, a, from the ocean as well. So we'll often refer to the Petaluma wind gap, but the literal um, topographical feature of the low spot in the mountains is called the Petaluma gap. So there is just a question about um, clarifying names. But what we wanna look at here is just, you'll notice that um, in this map, Three of the vineyards, there's four different vineyards we're going to talk through here um, as part of the Russian River, but three of them look remarkably close and yet actually have really quite distinctive um, characteristics. Could you talk to us about that? Sure. So, um, so when we're looking at the, the map of the Russian River Valley to kind of orient ourselves, um, Elaine mentioned that there's, um, there's different neighborhoods within, within the Russian River. Um, and these neighborhoods have kind of been defined over time by generations of, of winemakers and, um, and, and beer donors. Um, with the knowledge of some of the different characteristics and different, um, you know, climactic uh, environmental patterns that you see throughout the AVA. Um, so when we're looking at those top three, um, top three vineyards, Bowtie, Eastside, Knoll, and Foggy Bend, um, they don't appear far apart on the map. Um, although they are quite different in terms of the characteristics um, of each vineyard property and the resulting um, style of Pinot Noir that, that each produces. Um, the, the northernmost uh, neighborhood in the Russian River Valley uh, is referred to as the Middle Reach. And so that is where Bowtie and Eastside Knoll lie. Um, Foggy Bend is kind of on the border between Middle Reach and another neighborhood called Laguna Ridge. Um, and I say that with a little bit of a caveat because these neighborhood borders are not absolute. Um, you know, there's some, you know, there's some nuance to them. Um, and see, I like this map because it, it, it shows the dispersion um, between these three properties. So in talking about some of the differences, um, our Bowtie Vineyard, uh, it's planted in nine different um, clones of Pinot Noir. Uh, it's our northernmost Russian River Valley estate vineyard. Um, and it's definitely, it's, it's almost every year um, the earliest ripening. Um, so oftentimes um, we'll be in there um, picking the third week of August. Um, which always feels really early, um, but it is because it's the warmest, the fog burns off the earliest there. Um, 
And then as you bounce over to um, to the east side of the Russian River, you'll see our east side Knoll Vineyard. Uh, this was the very first uh, vineyard property owned by Jay, um, and it was planted, uh, what's currently producing right now was planted in the late 90s, um, and it's planted primarily to Pinot Noir. It's on this kind of ridge, um, and I think we'll see a, a picture of what the vineyard looks like uh, later. Um, but beautiful rolling kind of undulations throughout the vineyard, um, kind of a rusty, silty, um, uh, red-colored soil. Um, produces really interesting, um, distinctive Pinot Noir. And then, you, and then you go down to the Foggy Bend Vineyard. Um, so this, this is the picture right here of, the, of Eastside Knoll. Um, you go down to the Foggy Bend Vineyard, and as you can see, it's kind of at the curve of where the Russian River starts to, uh, to head westwards. Um, and we call it Foggy Bend for a reason, um, because the fog tends to kind of sit there and hang out um, for a longer duration each morning. Um, it's a little bit of a cooler site, a cooler pocket, um, and again, provides really different um, characteristics of Pinot. Well, and so um, the, the fourth site, though, that also goes into this Russian River Valley Pinot is much further south. If we could go back to that map, it's still part of Russian River. I love this, though, that you can really see that those sites are tucked in right along the river. The Russian River Valley AVA, of course, also goes a little bit further south and into that um, area close, really quite close to the ocean influence, as we mentioned. But Canfield is in the neighborhood we would call Sebastopol Hills. So could you talk to us about how that part of the Russian River Valley differs from that kind of more northern area you were, we were just looking at? Sure. As, as you're driving, you can really see a difference in, in terrain. Um, when you're up in the Middle Reach and Laguna Ridge areas, um, you know, there's, a, there's a close proximity to the river. Um, there's also a lot, of, a lot of hills with forests, um, redwood trees. Um, it, feels, it feels much more foresty. As you come down um, south, you're more in kind of a, um, you know, rolling hills and pastures. Um, you know, Canfield actually used to be a, a chicken farm um, prior to being planted for, for grapes. Um, but it's, very, it's a very different terrain. Um, the soil types start to differ a little bit. Um, we get a lot of Gold Ridge soil, Gold Ridge series soil um, in Canfield, um, which is fantastic for, uh, for Pinot Noir. Um, but it's also much cooler. So I mentioned Bowtie is um, the first vineyard that we would harvest on any given vintage. Canfield is almost always the last. Um, usually it's late September or early October by the time we, um, we pick the fruit in there. And that's because, you know, a lot of times it's gray skies down there. You get the winds that come up um, off, of, off of the coast. Um, and it's just this extended, um, extended growing season as you move further south. Well, and so now we talked about how to approach blending with sparkling wine and the, each of these sites in these different neighborhoods, you know, my understanding is they have, you know, quite distinctive characteristics that show up in Pinot. So in making something like the Russian River Valley Pinot Noir, how do you, how do you approach blending these different sites and the lots from them to make a red wine? Sure. I think, I think this is one of the, um, th this is the best thing about putting together the blend for the, our Russian River Valley Pinot because it is really kind of this um, harmonization of vineyards from all of these different, uh, different neighborhoods within the AVA. Um, and when we're talking about Bowtie, we're talking about Eastside Knoll, you tend to get um, more lush, riper um, type of fruity characteristics, mm -hmm. um, maybe more floral, but just, you know, kind of a broader palette and more just ripe, ripe uh, fruit in general. Um, as you move further south towards Foggy Bend, um, it's much more earth-driven. There's pine needles. There's, you know, kind of cranberry, more tart uh, red fruit. Um, and then moving all the way down into Canfield, um, Sebastopol Hills, I tend to see a lot of bright acidity, more savory characteristics. So the fruit isn't quite as expressive. Instead, there's more spice. There's, you know, tobacco, cigar box, um, and some really interesting savory characteristics. So 
Um, in terms of my approach for putting all of these together, what I'm looking for is, um, is a blend of all of those attributes. So it's kind of the best of the best of what the ABA can provide. Um, and, uh, and it's really interesting how it, how it comes together. Um, well, cause it so really, we've got some, well, cause I really ahead. do see all of those, those characteristics that you were talking about in this wine. It's, it's really, um, this particular Pinot again, it's, you know, it's, it's really quite easy to suggest this as a wine if people contact me from out of area wanting, you know, a suggestion for a California Pinot, like this is, it's, it's reliable, it's expressive, it, you know, it, there, there is really a wonderful harmony to of this, of all these complex of characteristics that you're describing. And so I think it really speaks to the um, advantages of creating a regional blend, you know, which is really quite different from from the process of creating a single vineyard wine and, and um, thinking about what we need to make a single vineyard wine. So one of the things that we're going to do now is actually look at another Pinot that you make, which is a single vineyard wine, but also from outside the Russian River Valley. And so if we could pull the broader map up again, I wanna point out, um, we're gonna look at this site that is tucked way into the mountains in the Sonoma coast, um, quite far north in the county. And, um, Yesterday, when you and I were talking, you had actually just driven back from um, from Annapolis Ridge. And so tell us, it's actually this it's still within Sonoma County. It's really not far from the Mendocino border. But if you look at this map, you can see how undulating and textured the mountains and forest are there. And it is actually a challenge to get out to Annapolis Ridge just because the the roads are so unbelievably windy. I've gotten car sick every time I've gone out there, even if I'm the one driving. <laughs> um, but but talk to us just about, you know, we'll look at the wine as well, but just about how this area way out there in the mountains differs from the sites we were just discussing with Russian River. So I love Annapolis Ridge uh, and just that whole, that whole region. Not only is it, is it beautiful, um, but it produces some really distinctive wines, especially when you compare them to the Russian River Valley. Um, you know, in terms of qualities of, of both wines, Russian River Valley, I get a lot of, you know, bright fruit, maybe more red, um, cola, spice, uh, savory notes. Um, but then if you move to the far Sonoma coast, which is where we call um, the area that, that Annapolis Ridge is located in, um, you tend to get darker fruit characteristics. Um, the darker fruit, again, kind of earth big tannins um, and, and a brighter acidity um, in general. So it's quite different from Russian River Valley. Um, not located terribly, terribly far apart from it, but the terrain is different. The yeah. elevation is different. The arc of sunlight is different as well. Well, and the, um, for me, the, the Pinots that I have from that area way into the coastal mountains, there's always this sort of fresh, coastal evergreen forest element like a resinous forest um but a, you know uh that evergreen aromatic and flavor and again this this um this right it feels rocky you know it feels like this rocky exposed forest of pinot and the the tannin you know you mentioned the tannin structure is quite different and the wine is just a little more grippy you know there's just a little more yeah. grip i think of for me, Russian River Pinot always feels like this like hovering red orb in the middle, like that like hovers in my mouth. And the, whereas the um, Annapolis Ridge and that real mountain coastal parts of Sonoma feel like they, they settle down, they're grounded, they're savory, and again, really forested. It's very different experience of Pinot. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, where this, where this particular vineyard sits is about um, seven miles as the, as the crow flies from, from the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's at a little bit of an elevation on a hillside, um, really kind of thin soils that drain readily. Um, here's the picture of it kind of standing at the top of, top of the property. Um, but it's, it's very low yielding. There, there ends up being a lot of concentration um, in, in the fruit that we harvest. And, uh, you know, I always know during harvest time when I'm walking around and, and tasting our different fermentation tanks, um, I don't even need to look at the tank tag. I know immediately that a particular tank is Annapolis oh, yeah. because of its color. It's, it's like this inky color. It almost looks like Petite Syrah. 
um, and tends to just have, it tends to have a bit more grip, um, especially early on. And then again, that signature acidity. Um, and so for this wine, we end up, we, we age it longer in bottle prior to release. Um, just for those, for those very reasons as we find that it really starts to come into itself uh, after about 18 months in bottle. Right. Well, could you talk a little bit too about, you know, what is it about this site that kind of lets it stand out as being bottled on its own versus, you know, versus other sites that really speak to being part of a blend? Could you just comment on what, what, what stands out to you when you're seeing those kinds of differences? Sure. Um, I mean, this this site <laughs> um, provides probably the most unique Pinot Noir that you know that I've worked with. Um, you know, it's I mentioned it's an at an elevation. Um, it's got close proximity to the ocean. Um, it's an outcropping of, of Gold Ridge soil, um, which is which is pretty interesting, um, and planted primarily to um, to Dijon clones. Um, so it's a variety of different clones out there. Um, we keep them all separate in the winery. Um, actually, for all of the Pinot Noir, we keep um, we, we keep clones, sub-blocks, et cetera, um, separate throughout the process. So in the end, we have something like 100 different um, lots of, of Pinot Noir on any given vintage to select from. Um, and when we do the lineup, just like with the sparkling, we taste through all of these, all of these blinds. Um, and I... Um, can pretty much always pick out the Annapolis just for uh, its distinctive mouthfeel um, and color properties. One thing that I that we should clarify too is anytime you're talking about Sonoma County wine, but especially Pinot, the mention of Gold Ridge soils is going to come up. And so just for people that are less aware, Gold Ridge soils are, are made from decomposed sandstone or eroded sandstone. And, and so they're, it's a very fine powdery um, soil that is um, verges in size from silt to sand. Uh, silt and sand are just terms that denote difference in particle size of the soil. But the um, gold ridge soils is often quite red from being iron rich, but in some areas is a little more what I would call blonde or you know like a more of a like a flaxy colored yellow. So the it's just a very fine soil, but it's really a lot of Sonoma County has um, Gold Ridge soils. And what we've found with Pinot is it tends to really help elevate aromatics and create this really unique kind of what I think of as melting tannin mouthfeel. So there's plenty of tannin, but it really kind of melts and spreads across the mouth. Um, you mentioned clones though, and I know people are um, curious and someone's asking if you could, you mentioned earlier that there are certain clones for sparkling that create the bigger berries and for sparkling that's more ideal. Could you name what those are? Sure. And it, it, it kind of it kind of varies. Um, you know, we do some sparkling we do some sparkling specific clones. Um uh clone 131 um Pinot Noir. Um I also like I also gravitate towards eight clone eight two eight, um which is which is a bigger berry um and tends to have more juice to it. Um, so that's good. Vaudenville is, is also a nice clone for Pinot Noir. Um, and, then, and then for Chardonnay, it just varies. We've been known to do some, um, some clone 76. Um, clone 4, if it's planted in the right location as well, can make a very nice sparkling base. Right. So 828 and 76 are both Dijon clones. And clone 4 is actually, uh, essentially, it's heat-treated Wenti. So it's Wenti that's been treated to get rid of virus basically. So to give people a sense. And you are making both of the Pinots that we talked about today, but your Pinots in general as 100% Pinot as well, right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. These, are, these are both 100% Pinot. Um, and, uh, and I should also mention with the, with the Russian River Valley uh, wine, you know, we saw this, the, you know, Canfield Vineyard, Eastside Knoll, Foggy Bend, Bowtie. We also make vineyard designate wines from each of those properties as well. So, mm -hmm. Um, so it's very interesting when you can taste our whole portfolio because you, you can dive into these single sites and see some of the nuances and differences between them, um, but then also taste them, um, you know, all together and kind of with a synergistic uh, effect. So, um, and they're all quite unique and distinctive. Right. Well, and so I, my understanding is for Jay, you really think of the Cuvée 20 that we started with the sparkling wine and then the Russian River Valley Pinot as sort of the two flagship wines, and those are available in many locations and then the different single vineyards are more available kind of directly through the tasting room is that right 
That's right. That's the the single vineyards. Um, and then we do a few other, um, you know, as we get into our sparkling portfolio, we do a Blanc de Noir, a Vintage yeah. Brut Rosé. Um, we do we do several more wines. We're, they're, they're limited in quantity. We're only producing a few hundred cases of each. Um, and they're available through the tasting room uh, or through our website. Well, and your, club. your extended Tourage wine is another good example of that too. So it, sparkling, that's just been aged even longer, essentially. Yes. Yeah. We, you know, all in all, we make about, um, it's close to 30 different wines now within the portfolio. Um, and the vast majority are, of those are all, you know, kind of small lot wines that are, you know, limited in distribution um, and that we like to uh, have guests enjoy when they visit the property. So we are getting close to the end here, but one of the things I just want to ask you to mention briefly, you also make Chardonnay, you make Pinot Gris. And, you know, one of the one of the things I think is unfortunate, Pinot Gris has sort of gotten a bad rap um, in the last 15 years or, or so, uh, but it really, you know, classically speaking, is one of the noble varieties, and you're actually able to work with it to make two different styles of wine, which I think each do show that kind of... Um, the strength and, and grace of the wine. So could you speak just very briefly to, to the work that you do with that variety and how, do, how does working with something like Pinot Gris differ than, um, than working with something like Pinot Noir besides the obvious that you press one off to make a white wine and you leave the other on skins? Sure, yeah. Um, we, we've we been fortunate to be very successful with, with Pinot Gris. We, um, we produce a California Appellated Pinot Gris as well as a smaller lot um, estate vineyard Pinot Gris. Um, and I think, I don't know if I would compare the similarities between uh, Pinot Gris winemaking and Pinot Noir per se. I would almost compare or equate um, the, two of, uh, the two of them, uh, Pinot Gris versus sparkling, um, because we're looking, you know, as with sparkling for a purity of fruit, right. um, you know, pure flavors, bright flavors that, you know, really capture um, place in which they're grown. Um, and so, you know, so all of our Pinot Gris is um, similar to the sparkling handpicked. Uh, when we're able to get onto the cocard presses, we actually use the cocards uh, for, for pressing the Pinot Gris as well. Um, and so, um, and then from there, we're just looking for nice, bright, you know, clean flavors that are reflective of, of California. Um, the estate Pinot Gris is a really fun wine to make as well. Like I said, it's, we make it, um, it's, it's much smaller uh, than the California Pinot Gris, um, but it comes from one of our estate properties just up the road called Monte Bianco, uh, which is an exquisite property. And it's really cool. You find these, um, these fossilized uh, clamshells oh, wow. from, um, from way back when the area was, was underwater. And this is miles and miles inland from the Pacific. So it just kind of speaks to, uh, to the, his the geological history of the region. Um, but that wine, you know, tends to have a lot of minerality, um, texture, kind of uh, tension to it. Um, and, and it's a really lovely expression of, of Pinot Gris from, um, from estate sites located close to us. Right. So you'll, um, I'll ask the, the behind the scenes team that helps me do these seminars to forgive me for bringing up a wine that you didn't expect us to talk about. But I just think that both the estate and the California Pinot Gris, they're such, um, they're such, I just think of them as hallmark wines for the right for that variety. And I, I think they're worth mentioning. So there's one last question, um, which is pretty straightforward. So we'd have time to address it. Someone is just asking, why is it called Jay? What, where does the name Jay come from? Fantastic question. Um, so our founder uh, is, is a woman named Judy Jordan. Um, so hence the name Jay. Um, and, you know, she's a, she's a member of the Jordan family up in Alexander Valley, uh, who are obviously very well known for their, for their Chardonnay and Cabernet. Um, but, but she set off um, when she was in her 20s and wanted to make world-class sparkling wine. Um, and so, uh, so in 1986, she, uh, she started Jay in order to be a sparkling wine house in the Russian River Valley. Well, and it's pretty remarkable timing and story because it, you know, it's this uh, relatively young woman set out on her own in the 80s to start an entirely new winery focused on sparkling. You know, the, the timing is um, pretty remarkable, just all each of those details. Um, and so Jay is uh, the name she gave and, and captures both parts of her name. Yes. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I think a cool part of the story as well is that, um, you know, she studied geology um, at Stanford. And so, um, so, you know, she was big into soils and um, into the terrain and recognized the Russian River Valley early on before it was really, wow. um, you know, recognized extensively as, um, as, a, as a great place to grow um, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and, and Pinot Meunier. Well, and it's worth reminding us too that we're so used to thinking of Pinot Noir in the world of wine now, and we're I think pretty I think the world's pretty used to thinking of California in relation to Pinot Noir now. But in the 1980s, those western parts of Russian River Valley were were far 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 less planted than they are now. Pinot Noir was not one of the heralded grapes of California. There was actually still very little in the state, and sparkling was not a heralded um, go-to wine, any really kind of anywhere yet. And so for her to have that sort of forward thinking, and especially coming from what really is a pretty Cabernet focused house, it's really quite a, a stepping out to do something that at that time was super unusual. Yeah, absolutely. And kudos to her because, um, you know, uh, look at what we've built since then. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be part of this portfolio. One of the things that has been really revealing for me in this series of conversations we've been able to have through these webinars is just that, um, just that combination of legacy and continuance, you know, so, you know, the work you're getting to do now really comes from and honors the legacy that someone so forward thinking helped establish and, and, you know, she was one of the people that helped show the potential for Russian River. And now you're getting to show that and really um, sort of expand and carry forward that vision um, through the, the wines that we've talked about today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We are, uh, we're at the end of today's time, but thank you so much for, for being with us. And I really want to thank everyone who has joined in um, to watch today. There are some of you that have actually joined every single episode uh, from <laughs> the beginning of April. And so thank you, especially to all of you. And um, thank you to people really who are calling in from all over the world today. It's really uh, continues to be an honor to have time with, with all of you. And I hope that our being able to dig into um, sparkling wine today has kind of helped bring more detail and understanding to, um, to your wine knowledge. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, a reminder to our attendees, a recording of today's webinar will be published to the California Wine Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days, and all participants will receive an email with the link to this video. And we hope that you'll join us next week to welcome the team from Quintessa in Napa Valley, Estate Director Rodrigo Soto, and winemaker Rebecca Weinberg, plus wine terroir consultant Pedro Parra. So that they're going to talk Cabernet Sauvignon next Tuesday, June 30th at 10 a.m. Pacific. Thank you. <laughs>